As of this time, we are going to have a continuation of our discussion for Lesson 1, which was on the importance, characteristics, process, and ethics of research. By the way, the presentation that I had with you since Monday, and which also includes this day's presentation, is in reference to research in general. This is not yet, ex the, the, the discussion is not, ex is not exclusive for qualitative research only, nor I am particular for it only for quantitative research. This is for research as a whole. And so I'm going to share with, uh, to, sh to proceed the share screen. Present now, I'll present a window, and I'll present this, I'll share this. Few seconds more. The share screen is set. Five, eight, more. There. Once again, here are our characteristics of research. Research is believed to be empirical, logical, cyclical, analytical, critical, methodical, and replicable. Sorry if the last word is expressed in noun form or in noun structure. But if you want to express that as replicable, then please do. It's all, it's all right. It's totally fine. So we proceed with the next slide, which presents the research process. The six steps that people go through, most especially students, have to go through in order to accomplish this task known as research. The research process begins with having a general problem in mind. Remember that empirical characteristic of research, which, which is explained in terms of the experiences and observations researchers can actually have, because that could actually, that can greatly contribute to the selection of a general problem. You don't have to be somewhere else. You don't have to think of something so so encompassing of so much because you can just you can just actually look outside your house or consider the classroom look at your own family and try to come up with a problem which you think research could address without that problem without having a good problem we can't actually conduct and proceed with the conduct of research as to the characteristics of this research problem, take note that research problem has to be within your area of interest. Anyway, that's also found in the module, which I think you'll also have later on. I'll just talk of the characteristics or factors to consider in selecting a research problem later on because that's, I think, found in the next slide. Going back to this, the research process gives highlight and importance to the selection of a general problem. It considers that as the first and foremost step in doing research. Second, some literatures have to be reviewed regarding that problem. What literatures are we referring to? When we say literatures that are significant to research, we are pertaining to probably related studies, meaning researches that have been conducted that bear the same intent or same variable or variables found in the research that you're already doing. Also, literatures might include concepts and statements or definitions or ideas that people and authorities in the world, in the scholarly world, have contributed regarding the variable or problem that you're trying to deal with. Even a legal basis could count as a literature for that problem that you are trying to address in your research. There needs to be quite a number of them in order for you to proceed with your research. Having a good pool of literatures in your hands would supplement your, your desire to, to establish that there's really a need to conduct this research. In fact, when people look at your rationale or I know that we pronounce that. There are so many who pronounce it as rational. I'm just fond of pronouncing it as rationale. When people go over that part of your research, they would look at, they would actually look at this question. The researcher placed this problem. 
is this problem worth the time to be studied? Is this really a problem that should be addressed? If an authority out there supports your decision to do a research on that problem, then the rationale served its purpose by then. It will have served it per its purpose at the time because an authority gave a supplement to your decision on doing a research for that particular issue or concern. All the more when you are now to create some support of your interpretations. There is a part in your research, in, your re in this research undertaking where when data come out or when results come out, you have to look for a support for whatever results had sprung out from your research. Your literatures could actually help on that one. The more literatures you have, the better. From there, after knowing your problem, after identifying the literatures that are now in the pool of in your hands, you select a specific research problem, which will be translated later on into some research questions. And from there, you create a, a temporary answer, an inference, an educated guess to one or probably to many of your re research questions. That I'm referring to is, uh, what I'm referring to there is the hypothesis. Then you proceed with the data collection. Your research won't be completed with just the, the description, the narrative of why you had to do the research, will be benefited from the research, and what steps you plan to undertake. Yes, they may be presented during a thesis, uh, a proposal hearing, but that does not complete the doing of the research. Data will have to be collected, and these data can be numeric or descriptive or narrative, depending on the nature of the research you'll do. By the time data will have been collected, after the time data will have been collected, you proceed with its analysis and presentation or display. In the presentation and display of the data, you might want to use some tab tables, some graphics or some charts, some visuals, which would help facilitate the easy and better the easy and uh, better understanding of the information you have gathered. It would be too burdening for the eyes to look at your tabulation, like stick tabulations, or to see it so many numbers. That is why there's an art in the presentation and display of the data. And these data need to be analyzed. The analysis will eventually lead to the findings and conclusion or generalizations concerning the problem that you're trying to address in your research. In the format that we'll do, the presentation, analysis, and interpretation are all placed in one chapter. The conclusion is set in another chapter. Only though we need to have first our data collected. Without the data being collected, we can never proceed with the presentation, analysis, interpretation, and with the formulation of the, the conclusion. That's the research process. Any question? Any question? If there's none, I'll proceed to the factors. The one that I was talking about earlier, the factors that we need to consider in selecting a research problem. The first one is as much as possible, that research problem should fall within your area of interest. This is in relation to what I've said regarding one research subject that you'll take when you proceed to grade 12. There's one research subject there which has to be conducted in relation to the strand that you have chosen in senior high. That is at par with the intent of this factor. A researcher's area of interest matters in choosing a research problem. I could recall in the case of Nicole Gulosino, she, she conducted a research concerning itself with, uh, which concerned itself with the preferences of the customers of the store that the her that her family owns. So she made a questionnaire, and the choices there would revolve around the many products that they sell in their store. Talking of customer preferences, why was that in her area of interest? First, 
Nicole Golosino took up ABM as a course in senior high. Second, that research will be beneficial to the store or to the family who owns that store. Thus, it really is aligned with what interests Nicole at the what interested Nicole at the time. For whatever it is that's going to benefit their store that is within her line of interest. Here's another one from Nathan Mamakos, who was also in ABM. Nathan Mamakos did a research on customer satisfaction with the Intra Herbal product and the Nutria Herbal Capsule. Why did Nathan deal with that kind of research, customer satisfaction? Because aside from it, aside from customer satisfaction falling under an ABM strand, Nathan and her family and his family are also uh, what is it, clients or customers of the Nutria Herbal product and uh, what is this Intra Capsule in, in, Nutria Herbal product and the Nutria Capsule. So the research that he did is within his area of interest for the simple reason that he is a, a user of the product. So that's what I'd, I'd like to invite you to work on regarding your research problem. Ask yourself first, what is your area of interest? Like, examine the kind of researcher that you are, the kind of student that you are. Like, for instance, I'm into sports. Uh, I definitely, I'm not. Definitely, you can see it in my body that as a teacher, I'm not into sports. But let's assume, let's assume that I'm into sports. Since I like sports, I might want to do a research related to sports. For instance, I'll have this research. Students, uh, the attitude of my classmates towards playing, uh, and playing outdoor sports versus playing indoor sports you see my topic is in relation to sports why did i think of that because for some reasons that's within my area of interest sports or i'm into fashion so i'll try to ask people i'll try to let people evaluate their own fashion statement see that's my research why? Because it's within my, my interest regarding fashion. Sir, I'm into food. Okay, let's talk of food in your research. For anything that is in your line of interest, try to tap that and look for a research problem that you could associate to that area of interest. Second, also consider this, most importantly consider this, the availability of funds. Not just of funds, but of all, not just of financial concerns, but of all your other resources. Time is one. Time is such an important resource that you should always keep in mind because it has a very crucial impact in the success or failure of your research. Also consider the number of people working on that research. Consider the amount of money, of practically speaking, the amount of money that you have or that might be involved in the conduct of the research. In as much as we want you to do something so grand and so ambitious, consider that you are still students as of this time. Do not, do not make it a point that the conduct of research comes out to be so much of a burden not just to you but also to your parents funding for your studies as of this year or while you are still well while you are still studying in senior high the study of dan lloyd minguito allow me to mention this the study of dan lloyd minguito he was a student of mine in one of the schools in the city he did uh, together with a group uh, with some mem with other members in a group they did a research using light-dependent resistors. What was their research all about? They created a mechanism when, such that when students pass by a door, there is a counter. Like there, there is a supposed target of the number of students. No, uh, wait, wait, wait. Their research was about this. They want to control, uh, they, they want to find ways to, to regulate elect the use of electricity. So, uh, let's assume that one room, one classroom has 40 chairs. If the counter reaches a number 
that's enough to provide electricity to one light bulb, the light bulb would turn would turn on. And they placed the light-dependent resistors by the doorway. So if someone passes by the doorway, automatically the counter counts for it as one person. Then another person passes by the doorway, it reaches another count. Until such time that all of the light bulbs in the room are lit, are turned on, because the counter in the, fir in the front door, the light-dependent resistors in the front door, had managed to count the, num the necessary number of persons for all light bulbs to be turned on. The same went with the back door. If there's a person who passes by the back door, it does a particular count of persons which would eventually call for the, re the turning off of the lights. So they were able to construct something like that. And I tell you, the total expenses that they had for one semester reached 10,000 pesos at a minimum. I thought it was a joke. I really thought it was a joke. And then they told me, sir, uh, this is our amount. And then I was like, Hui, why did you spend that much? Did your parents allow for it? Yes, sir, they found it all right. Anyway, sir, because they knew that it's a requirement for our subject. That's one thing that I would not want to happen. As much as possible, when you do research, do not spend so much. Spending so much is not the requirement for a successful research. Well, there are really wonderful researches out there that were invested with much money. In fact, there are so many researchers who had to ask for sponsors or request for sponsors to help them in the conduct of their research. Like in the success of their research, Without that sponsor, it would have not been made possible. It may be true to some, but I'd like to reiterate that's not my requirement here. Please consider, you have to print papers for me later on. You'll have to spend for, for of course, while you're studying, you have to spend for your tuition. There are still expenses that you have to show, your parents have to shoulder at home. I would not want my subject to come in as another burden asking for funds for you to spend in this research. In, sorry. <clears throat> in relation to that, that's one actually, that's one reason actually on why I would opt that the doing of corrections be done online. Because if we do the corrections online, we will minimize the number of papers that you'll have to print and print and print and submit to school. Doing corrections on online would would not have would result to not having any printed draft anymore the drafts are just purely online and corrected right away the last factor that i'd like you to consider in choosing a problem is this your ability and training this is a fact no matter how nice your thought is of the problem consider yourself do you have the necessary skills to be able to do it do you have the time to study the entire process, I'm referring to the training, the, the entire process and training to achieve what you are supposed to achieve in that research. It may, it may sound feasible. It may sound feasible while you, are, while you are reading or looking at the video that it was done. But consider this, do you really have the abilities to commit yourself to the doing of the procedures? Not that I'm doubting you. I don't doubt you, but I just want you to be really realistic. Consider yourself. Do you have the training and the skills? Sir, my study sir wants to have, um, wants to put metals together using a, a torch, which would require more or less you welding something. Sir, can I not just, uh, can I not just ask someone else do it for me research as much as possible has to be experienced if you let someone else do it for you though you are watching the process i bet it's still an entirely different story if you're the one who's doing the act of welding it's still going to be different if you're the one who's really manipulating everything in that research Sir, can someone coach me? Yes, of course. Can someone guide me while doing the, the experiment? Yes, of course. 
But what if that person isn't available all the time? What if when you were ready to do the research, that person whom you believed could have coached you did not make himself available for it or could not make himself available for it? What will you do? Will that mean that you will not do your research? This, this can be traced now to, did you have the necessary ability to do the research? Not again, please do not make it appear as though I have second thoughts of your skills and abilities. I trust you, but try to be realistic. Take note, people, we don't have the luxury of time to do this, to do whatever research we should do this year, this semester. So again, let's be realistic. Last year, last year, for qualitative research or PR1, there was one pair, yeah, there was one pair of researchers who wanted to talk of, their research problem was early teen, in, uh, what's that early teen? Early, no, ah, single parenthood. Single parenthood. And the, respond, the target respondents were women. And so my concern for the, I raised this concern to that pair. Are you sure you are the right persons to ask the respondents of the questions in your questionnaire? That's why we have social workers available because they study the, they have already studied the process before becoming a licensed social worker. If a student were to do it, you cannot blame any of these respondents to actually doubt the student of his or her skills on how the student will process the responses of that respondent. Because again, that student who wanted to study single parenthood with women as participants probably didn't know the right process or the right approach or they didn't have the right training to deal with such sensitive matters. So again, evaluate yourself. Do I have the necessary skill set to do this kind of research? It's being realistic, not pessimi pessimistic. Sir, I can do it. I can definitely do it. But what if? What can you do? What will you do if the respondent would say, Sorry, sir. Uh, sorry, doy. Sorry, die. I will not answer now because I will not answer that now because I don't know who you are. You're a student, but how will you? You'll put my answers. You'll put my answers in a research which will be filed in the school. You're going to make me a, a as an an object of your research. What will you do if that's the mindset of the participant? Unless perhaps if you are really a legit social worker and they would know, they would, I think they would give more regard to the social worker uh, because social workers are paid for this job. Because social workers have learned, have studied for this job. So see the difference if a student just deals with a sensitive issue compared to a professional who dealt with, who will deal with that issue. And that's my concern. Be realistic in evaluating your ability and training. Next, ethical considerations in conducting research. In the conduct of research, let's try to practice ethics. In my master's study now, there is a particular form that we need to fill out before we could proceed with the oral defense of our researchers. researches. We need to pass the ethics regulatory board. In, we need to pass the standards of the ethics regulatory board in 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 H &E because that's where our, that's where I'm taking my master's degree. If my work doesn't pass the standards of the ERB, then I could not proceed with the oral defense or in fact with the gathering of the data. Ethics really need to be will have to be observed. Ethics had something to do with objectivity and integrity. Make sure that your paper is free of any biases and prejudices. An objective work creates a good or promotes the integrity of your researchers, of you as researchers. If people find that your work is free of any of these biases, I assure you, they wouldn't see you as someone who is not with integrity. A work that is not afraid to show what it should show, a work that is not tampered, a work that is not prejudiced, is a work of a researcher with integrity. Second, 
as part of the ethics in research, we respect we, we show respect of the research subjects' right to privacy and dignity and the protection of subjects from personal harm. If you've been a res have you have you been a respondent of a research before while you while the school year was while it was still a face to face set, set up? If you've been a respondent, recall that experience of seeing a questionnaire. For the name section, I bet there's an optional part that is to protect your identity and right to privacy. But you know what researchers could actually do? We may not request them to really stipulate their name on the paper, but maybe we could put a code at the back. Like for instance, we have the class list. And then at the back of the paper, you will write one. And one there corresponds to the first person in the class list. And so you'll give that questionnaire to the person from the class. Like for instance, in the class list, it's John Buntag who happened to be person number one. So questionnaire one will be given to John Buntag. And then in the space for the name, John will not type in his name anymore because of the word optional. Even if John didn't type in his name, you would know that questionnaire number one belongs to John because of the code that you have placed at the back of the paper. But of course, the only person or persons who have access to this code would be the researcher or researchers themselves. No one else should have access to this code. Also, if responses turn out to be very sensitive, if issues are too sensitive to tackle and your respondent would opt not to respond, we cannot force them to respond. If they say, um, sorry, I'll just not say anything about it, we don't have the right to squeeze that information from them. Because who knows, recalling that question or re recalling an answer to that question probably tap into a traumatic experience. What if the study is about single parenthood? Again, let's just use that as an example. Huh? Single parenthood. And what if that being a single parent was caused by rape? See, the experience must have been traumatic. For sure it was. And the person wouldn't want to talk about it, but you've, li you've listed that person as your respondent. So you cannot say, Ma'am, sir. Uh, Ma'am, sir. <laughs> Ma'am. We really have to make you answer. You have to give an answer to this question. Ma'am, I will not leave unless you answer the question. You have no right to do that. Because you have to respect your subject's right to privacy as well as dignity. There are also instances where maybe you'd like to do an experimentation of letting someone use a facial cream. So you'd like to do a before and after like how it does, like, like how it happens in televisions. Like a before before picture and an after picture for, for a transition or a change to, to, to be seen. There might be others who would wish, please cover my eyes. Or if it's only the cheeks that should show, cover the rest of my face and only the cheeks should be shown. You will not have any other choice but to follow that request of the researcher, of the respondent. Even if the person happens to be your friend or a family member, if the person would not give his permission or approval for him to be published or to be publicized, we cannot publicize any of them. That is, again, in relation to ethics. Second, presentation of research findings in relation as well to objectivity and integrity. We must make sure that the findings we present are free of any bias and prejudice as much as possible we will not be influenced we should not be influenced by anybody by the time we present our research data the correct use of research role remind yourselves what sorry you remind yourselves of what you are as a researcher or what your prime your main role is as a researcher in the module I placed misuse of research role, please correct that to the correct use of research role. Number four, have that corrected as correct use of research role, not misuse of research role, because we're talking of ethical considerations in research.
the acknowledgement of research collaborations and assistance. Do consider there might be others who will ask for other for sponsors or like uh, a sharing of the many researchers that had spoken in the conference that they've attended in Palawan. There are actually so many students who went to laboratories outside of their school. They did the gathering of their data in laboratories outside of the laboratories or facilities that the school had because maybe the schools don't have the, the right facilities at that moment yet. And they actually gave credit to those organizations, labor laboratories, and other offices that had made their research a success. If you are doing a collaboration with other researchers, the names of those researchers ought to come out in your research. Lastly, non-distortion of findings by sponsor. The sponsors of the researchers researches have no power to distort findings in case the findings don't agree with their expectations or hopes. What if, what if, there's a cigarette company that had requested a group of researchers to do a research about the cigarette product because that cigarette company wants to publish a statement regarding how good their product is, how well it was welcomed by the people, only to find out that after the gathering of the data, results showed that actually very few bought it. And from those who bought the product, they were not impressed. When the sponsor knew of it from the researcher's analysis and interpretation, sponsors have no right to distort the findings, just so they'd be able to publicize that the, the product was actually a good one. They have to stand on what came out. And researchers also need to stand on what came out. Because again, remember that careful characteristic or element in the definition of research, the data are really carefully to be, uh, are to be really carefully dealt with. We cannot tamper them. And if we have ethical practices, there are also some unethical practices that people might do. The five that I'm going to show are just five of the many possible unethical practices. Deceiving a respondent about the true purpose of the study. We owe it to our respondents for them to know why we are requesting them to join in our research. We should tell them of what the purpose of the research is. We should tell them of why they have been chosen. Some that is why some in so many times those who will have picked someone as a respondent actually need to prepare first a letter. In fact, sometimes that letter would still have to ask for permission, whether allowing, uh, whether they would allow themselves to be participants of the research or not. Another unethical practice: a question that would cause extreme embarrassment or guilt or emotional turmoil that would remind the person, the respondent, of an unpleasant experience. Like the example that I gave earlier regarding that part, that respondent who is a single parent and that, that being a single parent was caused by rape. Any question that could bring out an unpleasant experience is one that is considered unethical. And so we need to filter questions the questions that we have in questionnaires or the tools that we use to gather our, our data need to be carefully examined so as for them to be within the confines of ethical research. Invading the privacy of a respondent. When the respondent would opt not to be interviewed, when the respondent would opt to say no, we are left with no other choice. We cannot just simply squeeze ourselves in in the schedule of respondents, nor can we ambush them. We are not to ambush them and make them immediate respondents to our researches. It's unfair and most especially, it's unethical. In fact, respondents should be given ample time to respond. They should be given sufficient amount of time to understand what your questionnaire is, not that they be ambushed for the answering of it. Studying the respondents or research subjects without their knowledge. But here's a danger here. I have to also tell you of this. In our discussion later on, you'll hear of a covert and an overt kind of research which uses an observation. 
So there is such a thing as a covert observation and an overt observation. An overt observation would mean that they would know that they are actually being observed. A covert observation would mean that they do not know an observation was going on. Between the two, which one do you think would solicit authentic and real behavior? Rain. Again, I have a choice. Here's the idea. For overt observation, they would know that they are actually being observed. For covert observation, they would not have any idea that they're being observed. Now, which between the two has a higher chance of soliciting real or authentic behavior from respondents? Rain. The overt one. Here's the thing with the overt one. When, when you know that you're being observed, how would you feel? And you know that that observation would take part of some in someone's research. Take, for instance, classroom setup. Classroom setup, ha? Teacher is teaching in front of you, and then suddenly the administra administrator comes in to observe. How will the students suddenly behave? Will they be, do you think they will just show their real selves right away? That's for, I, I don't know, but for some reasons, though, as experienced, when I was a student, when an observer comes, we became the good people in the community. And when the observer left, it's as if we have been freed from captivity. That's what happened. And then the same action. It's, uh, it's video recorded. Uh, Mang Zen might see this. Uh, or Sir Joe might be able to see the recording. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just be honest. There was a time when Sir Joe observed my class for Literature 8. Literature Grade 8. My students then were the batch of, were, were Ayman, Daniel Baluran, uh, Jessica Guillena, I could be a Baguio. In that class, I... I was surprised that the student's behavior was different from the typical kind of behavior that I had in a literature class. But I didn't know because my back at the time was turned at turned to the board because I was writing a poem on the board. And then suddenly, I, I felt like the class was just quiet because they noticed Sergio, but I didn't notice him yet. Then when I turned my, uh, when I already turned to look at the audience, at the students, that's when I noticed Sir Joe. And then, okay, everyone, please greet our observer. They stood all, they, all of them stood up, and the greeting sounded so well. And then it was a a uh, uh, the 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 flow of the class was quite smooth. It's that kind of flow that I wished was there the entire time. Were there the entire time. So, the observation was quite unexpected. And then, when the students knew that they were observed by someone, like they, when they were aware, as they are aware that there are eyes watching them, they portrayed a particular behavior different from what they usually did. And that's the danger with, a covert, with an overt observation. But for a covert observation, we, this kind of violates, or the covert observation kind of goes against this ethical an ethical practice. Because we are supposed to notify respondents if they are being observed. So how do we resolve this? Here's what happens. Here's a suggestion. Take for instance, you're going to observe a particular community in a barangay or in a district. So you will ask for permission from the head of the district. Like for instance, in Tutulan. You want to study the lifestyle of the Bajau community. So you will observe the Bajau community. You'll go there. From time to time, you'll visit the place. But you will not inform them that you are particularly observing them for research purposes. So what's going to happen? 
you'll ask for permission from the barangay from the barangay captain and also you'll ask for permission from the head of that local community that you're observing the bajao community has like a leader in that community so you're going to ask for permission from that person so only two persons will have known of that purpose of your study but the ones we who are directly observed will not have any idea of you staying there or going there for observation purposes. Next, when analyzing the data, you might want to reveal only part of the facts, present facts out of context or falsify findings or offering misleading presentation, such as lying with statistics. That kind of behavior is also unethical in research. And so that's the end of the PowerPoint presentation. Questions? Questions? That's, uh, um, that's the conclusion of it. Uh, to those who have not seen this discussion, or to those who have not joined this discussion as of this time, they can, of course, listen to the video recording later on. I'll already end the video recording.